Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to church. I see we have a few new faces, um, and I don't think we've welcomed you. Don't you just want to raise your hand if it's your first time here today? Just raise your hand. Don't be shy. We just want to welcome them. Just give them a hand. Just say hello. It's amazing having you here. We really hope you enjoy the service with us, and, in, and um, remember to get a coffee after it. It's on the house, I believe. Um, Albert and Derek and Sia, they're quite getting there with the coffees. Give them a rate out of 10, okay, just before you leave. Okay, before we get into it, let's just close our eyes and pray. Father, we thank you that you are so good. And we thank you, Lord, that you are here with us today. And as we have heard that you love us so much, Lord, we can celebrate what you have done, who you are. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. And when you died on that cross and when you rose again, it didn't stop there. Today you are conquered. Today you are victorious. Today you set people free, Lord. It's not something that happened in the past. It's today, Lord, and we love you for that. We say, Lord, be exalted, be glorified. Thank you that we can trust you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, let's open the word, um, our Bibles, to Matthew 28. So it's the first book of the New Testament, and it's the last chapter of that book, Matthew 28. I feel a bit far. Can I move closer? Okay, let's go for it. From verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. So if you're here today, you know what the story is about, right? If you're here today and you see, welcome Easter service, you know that something happened three days ago. Okay, we've been celebrating it the whole afternoon. We've been singing about it, that Jesus died on the cross, right? We've heard that he took our sin, our shame, our sicknesses. He took all upon himself. He died and he was in the tomb. Now, this is the third day after Jesus died. And what happened here is that the Mary, the Mary not the Mary, Mary, went to the tomb to go and put spices and, and oils and things on Jesus' body. But there was a violent earthquake, verse 2. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that part. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The gods were so afraid of him and they shook and became like dead men. The guards that were guarding this tomb saw this. Important for us to see that. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said, Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee, there you will see him, now I have told you. I also love that part, the angel is just saying, I did my job. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him and clasped his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priest everything that happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we 
who are sleeping. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been wildly circulated among the Jews to this very day. I just love the word. How God explains little details, and when we read this word, and when we read the account of what happened here, this is important, this little part at the end. It's also important what happened before that. But I have a question for us today. What does the resurrection mean to you? How important is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior to you? You know, we always speak about Jesus that died on the cross for us, right? But if Jesus did not raise from the dead, that will mean nothing. Then it means that we are believing in a a dead God, right? Then we can believe in any other dead God. But Jesus didn't stay in the grave. He didn't stay on the cross. What happens? He rose from the dead. He is alive. Your God and my God is alive today. That makes a big difference. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to you? You know, they say that the resurrection of Jesus is one of the things that is, there's so much evidence that he did raise from the dead. Even if you're not a believer, non-believers, or how do you say, unbelievers, they have searched, they have researched, and what have they found? They found that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And what happened to them? They responded and said, save me, Jesus. Doctors, lawyers, what's that one guy who, you know, criminologists or whatever they are, they have investigated this and they have found that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Rise, raise. My Afrikaans just ran, my English just ran out of there, but just tell it to come back quickly. Well, Mian, you must just help me. I know you're good with the Afrikaans English translations. So they say, Jesus really did raise from the dead. He he really is alive. Now, that is truth. It was proven. There's evidence. Now, if that is truth, like gravity is truth, what happens if you jump from a building? You are going to fall to the ground. Now, you might say, I don't believe in gravity. Are you still going to fall to the ground? Yes, you're still going to fall to the ground. So I don't have, if I say I don't believe in gravity, that's not going to make me not fall to the ground. So I might say that, no, I don't believe in Jesus, but that doesn't say he didn't raise from the dead, right? You understand? Does it make sense? So how do we respond? There's a few ways that we can respond to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to start with the first one. The first one can be, we, are know, we know it, we know about it, but we are doubting, okay? So many of us, we have grown up in church or we have heard the truth that Jesus rose from the dead, but we doubt it. Who here has ever doubted that Jesus really rose from the dead? We have a few honest ones here. There comes times in our lives when we doubt. We're like, did this really happen? And I want to tell you today that that's normal. That's normal to be like, sure, well, um, um, did did Jesus really, did he really, is he really alive? Did he really do this for me? The problem is just for us not to stay there, right? The problem for us is just not to stay at that place where we're like, oh, I'm doubting what's happening. And the thing about doubting is we have a reason why we doubt. And most of the time that reason is, Because we think our sin is too big for Jesus. 
We think we don't deserve the fact that Jesus died on the cross for me and he took my sin upon himself. Now, if that is you today, then I want to say, don't make your sin bigger than Jesus. Because the Jesus that rose from the dead, that powerful moment that happened where he conquered death, that Jesus surely is big enough to take your sin upon himself. If you are here today and you are doubting whether your sin, if you deserve it, I want to tell you today, you do not deserve it. None of us deserve what Jesus did for us, right? But he did it because of his love. He did it because he made us. He did it because we are precious to him. He did it because he was thinking of us, because he knew there's fullness of life for us in him. And that is the best news ever, if you are still doubting. You know, sometimes we go through life and then something happens and you're like, oh, I messed up now, what's going to happen, where am I going? And we're actually doubting the fact that Jesus took us in, right? Then I want to tell you, we can take action. We can take action. And what does the word say, how should we do this? Ephesians 6 tells us about the armor of God. And I'm sure we've all read that. But there's this one verse where it says, In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Now listen to what it says. With which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now Christoph so beautifully wrote, I read that scripture that says, There are now no condemnation in Jesus Christ. So if you hear that voice is coming to you, oh, you messed up, your sin is is too bad, you you don't deserve what Jesus did for you, oh, no, really, he's not going to take you back, then you must know that that is not the Spirit of God speaking to you. Okay? It sounds so simple, right? But yet every day we get this voice is coming to us and saying, you are not good enough, you don't deserve this, but... What does Jesus say we must do? What does the word say we must do? It says, take up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the fiery darts of the enemy. Now, what is that fiery dart of the enemy? Do you see anything coming? No, it's those thoughts. It's those things coming to our minds telling us, you're not good enough. You're not going to make it. You know, how can you believe in Jesus? It's those doubts coming. And how do, we, how do we resist those doubts? Not but standing and saying, please, Lord, help me. Sometimes that works, definitely. It's a good prayer to pray. But he says, take action. Take up the shield of faith. You know, I, was, I think it was last year I was lying on my bed and I was like, oh, this is so terrible. You know, and the next moment God gave me this scripture and he says, what are you doing? Take up your shield of faith. Lift it up. Don't let this enemy come and throw you with all these darts. I'm allowing it. Like, oh. Take up the shield of faith. I heard a preacher this week say, say, we cannot fight a lie by just resisting it. We have to fight it with truth. Okay? So sometimes we're thinking, oh, just go away, lies, and I I won't listen to you, and we're so trying to get rid of these doubts when we can take the shield of faith and say, hey, Jesus has died for me. I am loved. I am protected. I am the apple of his eye. I am free. I am forgiven. Amen? Amen? But we have to take up the shield of faith, right? It requires action from us. So if you're hearing those voices coming to you, make a choice. I love what my husband does. He prints out a whole list of scriptures, and it's on his, what's the um, thing? Mir, wall. 
Yeah, thanks. I need help, guys. You really need to help me. <laughs> and he goes and he declares those scriptures. Do you have those scriptures? Fight. We, we're not timid. We have Jesus, the risen Lord, in us. Let's take up that shield of faith and say, hey, enemy, stop this. Jesus is my Savior. He has conquered death, and I will not stand for these lies. I'm picking up that shield of faith. And what I love about the story of the resurrection is that in Mark, when the angel appeared to the ladies, that, and, 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 and the angel said to the ladies, go and tell the disciples and Peter. I love that part. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. He was highlighting Peter. Why is this so important? Because just three days ago, Peter denied Jesus three times. Now, if there's someone that doubted <laughs> that Jesus might have you know, died for him on the cross, it could have been Peter. If there's someone, it's, the Bible says he went out after he denied Jesus and he wept bitterly. He felt so bad because he denied Jesus. But three days later, the angel said, go and tell the disciples and Peter. God sees our doubts. He sees where we are at. And he says, hey, come Peter. My love is much stronger than your doubts or your fears or whatever it might be that is keeping you away from me. That was the first point, knowing Knowing about the resurrection and doubting. The second one is knowing and not believing. Knowing and not believing. Now you might say, how can you know about the resurrection of Jesus, but you're not believing it? Well, we see it clearly in the scriptures. What happened to the gods? They were there the whole night while Jesus was in the grave, right? Right? They saw the angel come. They heard, they felt the earthquake. They saw him roll away the, the stone. They saw the angel sat there. They saw Jesus wasn't in the grave anymore. And yet, they did not believe. Even the high priests, they said, listen here, someone was going to come and steal Jesus. So let's put the guards there. They put the gods there, and still when the gods came and told them the story, the truth of what happened, they said, listen, let's just make like this didn't happen. Let's lie. Let's say that the, the disciples came to steal him. So the high priests also chose not to believe. And that happens. I don't know if you have friends, family maybe, that you know, they know the story of Jesus, but they choose not to believe in it. A preacher once said, the root of unbelief is the hatred of God and the love of one's own sin. I don't know where the gods were at, they don't say, but I know that the high priest didn't like Jesus very much. They were so jealous, they hated him. And they wanted with everything to get rid of him. And maybe you're sitting here today and, and you've heard the story so many times, but you can't find yourself to believe in it. Maybe you're at a place where you've hardened your heart, where you've walked with the Lord, where you've known this truth, where you've made it part of your life, but now at this stage, you find yourself saying, I cannot believe it. I am too angry with God. Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you have chosen to believe it, but you found things in this world which is much more amusing according to you, or that you enjoy more, and you have chosen to go that route instead of following the truth. There's a story about this, this preacher who 
was also examining, you know, what happened. Did Jesus really, really rise from the dead? And, and he wrote this whole book, how he came to salvation, because he was studying this. And he went around to different places preaching this. And the one student came to him afterwards and said to him, listen here, I think the, the Bible is just like a book. It doesn't mean much. I don't believe in what happened there. And he said to the student, have you ever read the Bible? <laughs> and he said, no. And he said to him, well, then I want you to go and read Isaiah, and then I want you to go and read Matthew, okay? And then see the prophecies that was made about Jesus and his um, uh, death on the cross, and, 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 and come and, and, and speak to me again. So the student went home, and he read this, and he read Isaiah, and he read Matthew, and he came back to this preacher the next day. And the preacher asked him, so what did you think? He said, it's amazing. And I think it's the truth. And this preacher was very excited, you know, because this guy saw the light. And he said, oh, so are you ready to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? And he said, no. He said, I have a way too active sex life. And I know if I follow Jesus, I have to let go of that. You see, we can either hate God because of something that happened in our lives, or we're finding sin in our lives much more important than Jesus. We know nothing compares to knowing Jesus. We know that nothing in this world, no pleasure, nothing come close to knowing him. But there's people who don't realize this because of a hardened heart. But this is the good news today. This is the good news today that Jesus has the power over everything and over every hardened heart. And I want to tell you, there's people in my life who is in this place, but I will not stop believing that my Jesus can soften those hearts for them to see Jesus for who he really is. And allow him to come and minister to their hearts and show them who they are and how much God loves them. If you are here today and you feel, I am so far from God, please allow him to speak to your heart. Please don't leave this building without speaking to God and allowing someone to pray with you. We're not here to tell people how bad they are. We're here to show you that there's a way. And his name is Jesus. And he is for you. Amen? Amen. The third one. Knowing, believing and not applying. Knowing, believing, and not applying. What does that mean? I know the truth, that Jesus died on the cross. I know that he did it for me. I know the whole story of the gospel, and I believe in it. My heart is not hardened. I believe in it. I have been coming to church. I have been leading small groups, whatever it might be. But I am not applying this truth in my life. There was a doctor, he was a, an Albert can help me, oncologist, a lung cancer doctor. Okay, so he specialized in the lungs and um, treated many patients. And then one day they did an x-ray of him and he saw, oh my hat, my lungs doesn't look so well. And um, they did all the tests and whatever and found out he has lung cancer. He was 50 years, 55 years old, and four months later he died because of lung cancer. But that doctor smoked a packet of cigarettes every single day. And he also did it the last four months when he realized he had lung cancer. So this is an interesting story because this is a man who really knows about cancer and lung cancer, but knowing 
didn't make, and believing that this is what it is, didn't make him apply anything that he knew. Does it make sense? So many times we know the truth and we know that Jesus is our Savior, but nothing in our lives show that. I think it was Christoph who, who preached the sermon earlier this year and said that if we are kingdom people, we should look like kingdom people. You see, I am really excited about church. <laughs> I am really excited about what God wants to do in the body of Christ. I mean, there is a revival coming that we cannot explain, that we won't be able to contain, because God is going to do something great in us. And I want to know if you want to be a part of that. Because you know what? Us as believers have the greatest news ever. So we cannot go every day complaining about the government, complaining about the situation, complaining about... I complain, but if we do it every single day, and that is what is on our lips, and that is what we speak, and, you know, and, and our greatest thing is that how bad the service was at the restaurant. Then who are we believing in? Who is my Jesus? Who saved me? Who set me free? I have the best news ever. How can I go on complaining about things all day long? And that's just one simple example. You see, I think there's a time coming where we're going to start pressing into Jesus. You see, sometimes for us as believers, and I'm speaking to myself as well, we get so lazy in our faith with Christ. We come to church and we expect God to come and do something in our hearts. We come to church, nothing wrong with that, but we just come here and it's about us. And the worship must be spot on, really, because I need to focus and I need to be able to push in when we're missing it. Firstly, we're coming here to lift up the name of Jesus no matter what, right? But secondly, we're coming here because we're serving, because we have great news, because we, have, we, we are a body, you know. I might be standing here and giving a message, but you know what? Like from this week in our, in our intercession, now in our intercession here, and then, yeah, God spoke all the same words. He has been building this through the body of Christ. It's not a one-man show. We are all part of this. You know what? If, if uh, we went to watch a, a show last week, um, Marguerite was performing on a cello. She's just next level, right? For those of you who have seen her perform. She, she played for about an hour on the cello. Do you know how long she prepared for that one hour? 35 to 40 hours of practice on her cello. Who of you have done the comrades? Go, okay, Christoph. <laughs> you don't just pitch up that morning and say, okay, let's try this, see how far we get. No, when you run the comrades, you train. You prepare, you do your best so that you can go and finish that race. Now, the thing is, with us as believers, we don't want to do anything. I don't know where that got in, that, that we must just wait, and God is going to do something. Yes, waiting is good, but where is the pressing into Him? Where is the seeking Him? Where is the reading my Bible, saying, Lord, oh, I, I really struggled to get up this morning, but I'm going to. Even if I have to, like my husband said, that long five times to go off before I get up, you know, but I'm going to get up because I want to read your word and I will spend time in it. You know, we expect so much, but we don't, we're not giving much. So if you train for comrades, that's okay. That's not legalism, right? But when we start taking time and pressing in, all of a sudden it's legalism. Make time for God. Press in. Search for him. 
apply what you know. And I promise you, God is so, so faithful. He meets with us. You see, a few weeks ago, God spoke to me very clearly and he said, Marichin, you have to prepare. You have to prepare for every meeting. You see, because we're charismatics, right? We just go as the spirit flows. <laughs> God, come and do something. He said, now I want you to push in. I want you to pray. I want you to pitch up there knowing what I'm saying. I want you to, to know what I'm saying to the people around you. I want you to prepare. And you know what? It's not easy. It's not easy. It takes effort. It takes time sitting at the Lord's feet. It takes time when, you know, South Africa's playing cricket and they're doing actually well to say, wait, I'm going to switch off the TV and I'm going to sit with the Lord. It takes sacrifice. It costs us something, but the reward is unbelievable. Because you know what? If I see what God does in that moment, I prepare very well, but then I get into the meeting and God takes another turn and I see, wow, now it's Him moving. Do you want that in your life? Do you want that when you walk into your, your um work situation, and you see God starting to do things that you never could imagine. God wants that for us. He wants it for the people you are working with. Let's not just know. That's my fourth point. Let's not just know and believe, but let's apply. Let's apply this incredible, incredible truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, Romans 8 verse 11 says, The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is where? Living inside of us. Wow. <laughs> Meditate on that scripture for a week. Say it over and over and over in your head. Allow the Spirit to speak to you. What does that mean? The Spirit who raised Christ from the dead it's living in you and in me. How can my life look the same as the person next to me who don't know Jesus? I love this story about a, a man somewhere in Africa. I can't remember which country. They were really going through a very difficult time. And, he, and it was he and his family. And, and um, they barely had food to eat. So he decided he's going to go far and he's going to go work and get some money. Now, this family were believers. They loved God, and this man was devoted to Jesus. So he went away, he worked, got a little bit of money, and on his way back to his family, robbers came and took that money, stole that money from him. Now, you can imagine, you worked hard, you went far. The only little hope you had of this money for your family has just been stolen. And at that moment, he was so angry, he decided he's going to look for a witch doctor so that they can curse these robbers. And this is just how God works. He, he walked into the witch doctor's house, and he was angry, and he said, come on, you know, you, you have to, to, to curse these robbers that took the only money I had. <laughs> this witch doctor wasn't interested in what the man said. He just asked him, which God are you serving? And this man is a bit irritated and a bit shyish, and he said, you know, I serve God, Jesus Christ. And he said, but I came here so that you will curse the robbers. This, but this witch doctor was like, please tell me about your God. It's like, what's happening here? Do you know what happened with that witch doctor the moment this man walked into the room? Is that he experienced the power of God walking into that room. He experienced a light walking into that room that he never had experienced before. And when he saw this man, he said, I just experienced that you serve a God who is much greater than Satan. And I didn't know that there was a God who is more powerful, more glorious than who I have been serving. Please, how can I follow your God? This is our God. 
Now, if you, that person, you think, oh, I messed up, I, I went to want to curse someone, and God still came because he's living in you. He is the resurrected Christ living in you. Wherever you go, he shines. Isn't that amazing? Do you think that we need a new revelation about what that means? I certainly do need a new revelation. That when I step into the room, it's not just me stepping into the room, but it's Jesus. And I have to believe that. We have to believe it to see what God is going to do in these times. This week at intercession, and I I really want to encourage you to join a prayer team or come and join us for corporate prayer on a Tuesday morning. And if you don't like praying in front of people, don't worry. I went to to prayer meetings for five years and I didn't say a word. (laughs) But God spoke to me. And I want to tell you, when we come as a church and we see God, He speaks. And it's incredible to see how He leads. It's incredible to see how he is involved, how he, how he wants to lead us, how he has plans for us. It's, it's so amazing when this one person says this and that one confirms it and, and God is doing something and you walk out there and you say, yes, God is busy. But at intercession, while we were praying, all of a sudden, I just prayed this. And I said, when we walk into the room, it's like Jesus is walking into the room. And it wasn't like I planned it. You know, sometimes you speak, but you didn't plan it. And it's like, it's like God was just revealing something to me and say, wake up. Because the living Christ is living inside of you. And church, imagine we live like that. We get a revelation about what that looks like. I don't think our church service will be the same. I don't think our families will be the same. I don't think we will be the same. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ mean to you? What do you allow the Spirit to say to you today? What is he doing in your heart? Where is he calling you to? Because I know he's speaking to all of us in a precious way today. You see, sometimes, or many times, and it's the same for me, we come to church and we just go out the same way, right? But what if we allow God to work in our hearts? What if we allow the Spirit of God to move among us? What if we open our eyes to see Him for who He truly is? I want you to close your eyes. We're not going to call anyone to the front, or so don't even worry about this. Just in, as your eyes are closed, just look at that tomb, and the rock is rolled away. And your Jesus, who died on that cross, a horrible death, He's no longer in that tomb. He's risen and he is alive. And he's risen and alive and he loves you more than you can ever know or imagine. We pointed out four points to today. And we are at, tell the Lord where you are at. Just be honest with him. This is my heart, Lord. Maybe you're uncertain, maybe you don't know how to handle it. But you know what? God is a good father and he speaks to us 
and he waits for us with open arms. Sometimes all we need to say is, Lord, speak to me. I'm listening. Lord, have your way in my heart. His grace just washes over us. His mercy, his goodness, his justice, his righteousness, his forgiveness. Father, we worship you. For there's no one greater and there's nothing greater than knowing you, our God, our Savior, our friend, our Redeemer. You are so good, Lord. And we thank you for how you love us, how you pour your love over us, how you call us your children how you make a way for us, how you heal us, how you restore us, how you make us whole, how you set us free. And we thank you for your word, Lord, today, that you have for us (laughs) as your people, Lord. Thank you for doing a new thing in us. Thank you for restoring. And we celebrate the resurrection today.